Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest history group of the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. Today, we have with us Dr. Amara Thornton. She is a research fellow and the co-investigator at the Institute of Classical Studies at the University of London. And she is going to be presenting for us today on the histories of collections and the histories of Barbados. So basically an interrogation of um, the collections um, as they pertain to the history of Barbados. So the history of Barbados, the history of archeology span is in many cases intertwined with the history of the British empire. And the presentation is going to explore the history of archeology span and collecting in Barbados through records associated with 19th century collectors, including Thomas Graham Briggs, and Greville Chester. The collecting lives of Briggs, owner of Farley Hill in St. Peter and Chester, a one-time resident in St. Luke's Parish, highlight the ways in which African Caribbean histories can be revealed through primary sources associated with the histories of collections or artifacts, some of which are now held in UK museums. This presentation is going to highlight two recent projects, two recent projects, Mapping Collections Histories of Barbados and Britain, a digital exhibition at the University of Reading, and Animating Caribbean Collections, a knowledge exchange project through the University of London to show how these histories can be integrated into exhibitions and retold through creative practice. Amara Thompson is a historian of archaeology. She is a research fellow at the Institute of Classical Studies in the University of London and co-investigator of the three-year Arts and Humanities Research Council funded projects Beyond Dopability, Re-Evaluating Women's Work in Archaeology, History and Heritage in Britain, 1870 to 1950. She is the author of Archaeologists in Print, Publishing for the People from UCL Press in 2018 and co-editor with Dr. Katie Soar of Strange Relics, Stories of Archaeology and the Supernatural, 1895 to 1954 by Handheld Press, published in 2022. Please join with me this evening in welcoming Dr. Amara Thornton as she speaks with us. Dr. Thornton. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Although not in Barbados, I am in London. <laughs> um, so um, I'm going to um, tell you a little bit about myself and the kind of research I do, and then uh, talk about some of the stuff that I've been uh, exploring over the past few years, which is uh, uh, relevant to the history of collecting and collections from in and from Barbados and other places in the Caribbean as well. Um, I am a historian of archaeology, as you've already heard, and basically what that means for me is that I research the histories of recovery, collection, display of artifacts, and also how artifacts in archaeology are written about in public, popular publications. So things like literary magazines and newspapers and sort of popular history books. Also guidebooks, which are an excellent resource. Um, I have family from Barbados, uh, historically, my family has come from St. Thomas's Parish, so I do have a Barbados link. Um, my mother grew up in Grenada, uh, and she was always telling me, <laughs> even though I grew up in the U.S., um, she was always telling me that, that, that I'm West Indian and you are West Indian. So that's kind of inspired my um, research into Caribbean collections. I've been researching uh, the history of, of Caribbean collections and uh, histories of archaeology in the Caribbean since about 2020. Um, my PhD uh, and sort of postdoctoral research was on British archaeologists who are working in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, so this is a um, departure from my <laughs> from what I had, uh, you know, considered my research base, but it's been really interesting. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about the histories of collections of artifacts from Barbados and introducing two projects, um, as you've heard, that I've worked on very recently, specifically relating to Caribbean collections um, in the British Museum, but also links to other museums as well. Uh, I'm just going to start my clock so I don't um, go on for too long. Um, <clears throat> some of the source material that I'll be talking about includes antiquated language. So this is just a sort of content warning for you. 
Um, and uh, I'm interested in particular in how these sources can reveal histories of recovery and collection by people of African Caribbean descent um, and how these their stories can be integrated into museum interpretation and shared with uh, communities in the Caribbean and also communities who are outside the Caribbean, diaspora communities. I'm going to be using biography quite heavily to explore sort of links to local, national, and international histories. <coughs> and so I will um, now share my screen with you. I should have probably done that in the beginning, but anyway, here we go. Uh, let's just have the... Okay, so I'll just make this a bit smaller. So this um, is an excerpt from a book published in the 18th century by Griffith Hughes. Um, and you can see from this quote, uh, which is from this 1750 publication, that um, Hughes gestures towards the knowledge and awareness of indigenous history of the Caribbean that are that is held within the enslaved population, specifically um, a family that is um, enslaved uh, and associated with Thomas Tunks, um, this uh, gentleman in Barbados. Um, it also gives a sort of local site for knowledge that could potentially be traced in records relating to Tunks and his plantation. I don't know what his plantation was called, but um, it is in St. Michael's somewhere. Um, and so this is just a sort of introduction to the kinds of references that um, I've come across quite frequently in relation to the initial recovery of Caribbean, um, uh, indigenous Caribbean um, artifacts. But I'm really gonna concentrate on 19th and early 20th century collectors. And the first person I'm gonna talk about is uh, Greville Chester. Um, and Greville Chester was an English clergyman who lived uh, for a short time in Barbados in 1868. He was rector of St. Luke's Anglican Church in St. George's Parish. Um, and I have to say thank you to Natalie for providing me with an extract from the Barbados diocesan history, which um, gave us a, a parish for St. Luke's uh, Church. And um, Chester wrote a book called Transatlantic Sketches in which he talks uh, quite a lot about his time in Barbados and also an article um, called Shell Implements from Barbados, um, which is published in the Royal Archaeological Institute's journal um, on his return to the UK. Um, he charts his encounters in these two texts with um, Barbadians who are both named and unnamed, who were engaged in one way or another with the recovery of indigenous material um, frequently giving local place and estate names in association with the artifacts that are recovered. As you can see from the text uh, on this slide, um, the people that he's speaking about, uh, the African Caribbean people he's speaking about are not named. Um, and this is something that I'm quite interested in working out how to um, incorporate into museum collections histories and the way the ways in which we view this material. Um, their activities are evident though in in the ways in which Chester is um, referring to them. One person who is named um, is W.A. Culpepper, who as far as I can work out um, was a schoolmaster, potentially William Aline Culpepper, um, who is listed as the headmaster of Pilgrim's Place School in Tri Christchurch, but he was also a resident in um, a house called Frolic, which is in the Fontabell neighborhood outside of Bridgetown. So Chester refers to him um, in his Shell Implements article. Um, and, you know, it says that he's a sort of um, person of, of 
scholarly interest in the archaeology of Barbados um, in both the book and the article. And we can see from the source material, the sort of melding of historical landscapes and histories, the indigenous histories with the estate histories, the colonial histories, the plantation histories, the residential histories of Barbados. Um, while he was resident in Barbados, Chester was sending artifacts off the island and on the other end in the UK, we can see traces of collections histories in museum archives. This is a letter from Chester, which is held in the British Museum's archive, in which he is writing to Augustus Wollstone Franks, who was the um, uh, keeper of the Department of British and Medieval Antiquities and Ethnology, which is the department um, responsible for, for holding collections from the Caribbean. And he offers Franks um, what he's calling Carib implements. And um, letters that are sent to British Museum keepers offering collections don't necessarily always have evidence of original finders or find spots. This letter doesn't. Um, but it, they might, in this, as in this case, indicate um, collector motivations and present evidence of how artifacts circulated and were displayed prior to the final accession in the museum. So this letter um, talks about, Chester talks about his personal motivations. He's looking for stone tools, not shell tools, um, but he nevertheless uh, has collected a bunch of shell tools and he has exhibited them in various places and um, he's also offering them to Frank's for the collection. So taking Chester's articles, um, and uh, you can start to see local sites and places identified and associate some of these with people and particular places and things that are happening in Barbados at a very distinct period. So the, the sort of eight, late 1860s. Um, Mount Ararat, for example, where Chester and um, his, uh, his group of prisoners, African Caribbean prisoners, were excavating a cave. Um, that site, uh, the residence of Mount Ararat, was described in uh, a, an early 19th century um, issue of the Barbados Mercury and Bridgetown Gazette as a delightful place, um, a comfortable residence, uh, some three miles distant from town, this is a quote, and um, near one of the best sea bathing places on the island. So it gives you a sort of sense of place um, there. And then, so a next step, if you were going to continue this research, would be to see what records relate to that place and try and trace engagements with the history and archaeology on its doorstep. So maybe the owner of that place had a collection that was acquired locally. Um, I don't know who owned it. So <laughs> Chester sadly does not say who owned it, but that's something that could be a, a sort of a next step in the research. Um, this 1912 uh, guidebook image shows the proximity of indigenous sites to African Caribbean residences. And I would love to know exactly where this is. It's, it doesn't, it's not specific in the guidebook. Um, but just to show the sort of um, the melding, the, the proximity of houses to sites. And you get a sense of that in Chester's archive, Chester's uh, articles as well. Another key collector of the late 19th century was the Barbados born um, man, Thomas Graham Briggs, who lived in Farley Hill, formerly known as Grenade Hall. Um, that's the estate that was owned by his father, Joseph Leiter Briggs, and he inherited it on his father's death. Uh, Briggs's collection was significant, both historically, as seen in the quotes given here, and today in the UK, as it spread between uh, lots of different institutions, including the British Museum. Briggs's father was compensated <clears throat> at the abolition of slavery. And Briggs um, himself attended Cambridge. He maintained strong links to the UK throughout his life. He would travel back and forth um, to the UK from Barbados. Um, and 
After his education in Cambridge, he returned to Barbados to the life of a planter and a politician, as well as a, a keen collector of both antiquities and plants. So as you can see in these quotes, he amassed a, a fairly substantial collection. Um, some of it was by purchase from um, African Caribbean people who had access to this material and um, he's noted as, as purchasing, not for very much money, um, artifacts from them. Um, and it's also after his death, his collection was at least part of it still in Barbados and being circulated. So you can see at the, um, in the middle quote from the Stark, um, from Stark, which is a, a guidebook to Barbados. Um, Stark was allowed to take some artifacts, which were still in Farley Hill, away with him. Um, again, in these ref references, you can see the role of unnamed African Caribbean contributors to his collection. Um, and I also mentioned that he collected plants. He kept up correspondence with uh, Joseph Hooker at Kew Gardens here in the UK and um, sent him quite a lot of plants from Barbados and also from elsewhere in the Caribbean. Um, but he also sent him shell implements from Barbados. So again, this um, evidence of circulation of material, not just from um, someone to a museum, but to his contacts in London, wherever they might be. Uh, Briggs had a, a series of estates in Nevis, and he lived there for some time, developing a network of other collectors from whom he acquired material for his collection. Um, the journal Tamari, which was published by the Agricultural Society of British Guyana, devoted an entire article in the 1880s to Briggs's collection, and it maps out the extent of his collecting network, naming collectors in St. Kitts, St. Vincent, Nevis and St. Lucia. So it's a really useful resource. And I'll uh, come back to what that might look like a bit later. One <coughs> named um, collector who is of African Caribbean descent um, is Moses O'Daniel. O'Daniel, as far as I can um, work out from newspaper references, uh, was born in, Bar in Barbados and died in Barbados in 1901. By the 1870s, he had moved to Nevis, but he was clearly uh, mobile because he's mentioned by another English clergyman temporarily based in Barbados called uh, William Griffith. He's mentioned in Griffith's article about shell tools in Barbados. And it appears from the way that Griffith has um, written about him that they had a conversation um, or some, some form of communication. Um, and Griffith's collection is now in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Cambridge, but um, his article in the Cambridge Antiquarian Society's journal contains this reference to O'Daniel's thoughts on Barbados implements um, and uh, sort of contextualizes him as a, as a collector. It, there's another reference to Moses O'Daniel having at least one uh, stone tool from Nevis, I believe. Um, we also see here in this quote, um, Daniel's background. He was the son, as far as I can work out, of Rebecca O'Daniel, who is mistress of the infant school run in Barbados by the Society for the Propagation of the Gospel. Um, at the end of her life, I was pleased to see that she was awarded a pension of 10 pounds for her long service to the school. Um, and Moses O'Daniel was also a teacher and he worked uh, variously as a surveyor and an accountant and was a man of some note um, mentioned in several newspapers that I could come across, um, including in his wife's obituary, which was published in a Trinidad newspaper in 1910. So the history of collections is the history of connections and mobilities. Um, and I think you can't really get to grips with the histories of uh, collecting in the Caribbean without looking at histories of migration of all kinds. Um, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, many collectors 
frequently um, moved either temporarily or permanently to other parts of the Caribbean, as we've um, seen already. So when I've been doing this research, I have found it helpful to think of different kinds of collectors based on length of residence. Some are from the Caribbean, are born in the Caribbean, and they remain there, um, you know, for most of their lives, but they might migrate to different places within the Caribbean. So Moses O'Daniel and Thomas Greg Briggs are two examples of that, both born in Barbados, but residing for at least part of their lives in another place, um, in Nebus. In terms of Barbados connections, um, to collecting and collecting antiquities in general. The Branch family are also significant. Um, as far as I can work out, the, the two sons of Samuel Branch of Barbados, um, William James Branch and Charles Branch, were uh, collectors of antiquities and developed pretty significant collections. And William's son Christian also was involved in collecting. Another Barbadian abroad, so to speak, is Ernest Young Connell, who worked in the Public Works Department in Nevis and developed a significant collection of antiquities from um, those islands <clears throat> that attracted many visitors to his home, um, some of which were, were working in museums. And a part of the Connell collection is now in the British Museum, although I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, there are also short to medium term residents reflective of the colonial context of the late 19th and early 20th centuries that I've been the time period I've been concentrating on. Um, included among those falling into this category are colonial officials or administrators and their wives, um, Edith Blake being an example of the latter. She was married to Henry Blake, who was governor of Jamaica and Barbados, uh, sorry, Jamaica and the Bahamas. In the 1880s and 1890s. Um, I'll come back to her um, potentially a little bit later, um, but someone else I just want to mention um, briefly who has a Barbados connection is, a, um, is Hesketh Bell, who may be familiar to some of you. An interesting example of a colonial official who had a fairly deep and prolonged interest in both um, archaeology and, and folklore in the, in the Caribbean. His representation of, um, of fo the folklore of the Caribbean in his book, um, Obia Witchcraft in the West Indies, is very problematic in many respects. But in it, we see <clears throat> represented an example of how he talked about his collecting activities, in this case, in Grenada, for a popular audience. Um, he also kept uh, diaries covering um, a significant chunk of his career in the colonial service. Sadly, he didn't keep diaries from the earliest part of his career um, covering the time that he was in Barbados. Uh, but um, the diaries from a bit later in his career point to his collecting activities and his interests in antiquities and folklore. He had an extensive career in the colonial service, as you can see here, um, which spanned the, the Caribbean and different places in Africa. Although it's not clear at present how extensive an, a collection of artifacts he had, at least some of them are now held in Cambridge University Library and include artifacts from Barbados. Then finally, in our diagram, there are long-term residents, such as the three people listed here, all of whom moved to the Caribbean for professional reasons and remained there, if not in the same place in the region in general. So um, Henry Alfred Nichols is based um, in Dominica. He was a physician, but he also collected both artifacts from across um, several Caribbean islands and plants. And Thomas Huckerby was a Wesleyan um, missionary who was based in St. Vincent, but also moved around um, various places in the Caribbean, collected a lot of antiquities, um, some of which are now in the Smithsonian. And uh, George Hampton Tautain was also based in St. Vincent, um, but he also had associations with, with uh, British Guyana. So 
but he remained in the Caribbean for quite a long time. Um, so what do we have with all of these names? Um, we have a sort of very complicated network of mobility where the lines indicate places connected to each individual. And um, this looks very messy and it's meant to look messy because um, this kind of mobility can make it quite challenging to figure out exactly where an artifact originated um, and um, who the collector, where the collector was when they collected it and from whom because all of these collectors were probably collecting from a number of other people. Um, and all of this makes collections histories um, a very complicated um, thing to research, but also enormously interesting and rewarding. Um, so uh, it's just worth pointing out here also that um, collectors would display their material locally, whether it was in their house like Graham Briggs, or also in um, local exhibitions. So for example, Ernest Connell sent artifacts from his collection for display in an agricultural show in Basseterre in 1884. Histories of displays also give us insights into collectors and collecting histories. So this image is from Frank Kundal's Reminiscences of the Colonial and Indian Exhibition, which reflected a large scale exhibition held in South Kensington in London in 1886. Kundal was the longtime secretary of the Institute of Jamaica, and this particular detail shows the West India court. The exhibition catalog enables us to build a list of exhibitors from across the Caribbean who were named as contributors of what would now be considered archaeological material from the Caribbean. And it's important to note that there were a number of local exhibitions held in the Caribbean leading up to this exhibition, which um, are often referenced in local newspapers. And um, helpfully, the British Library has, has started to digitize uh, Caribbean newspapers from this period. So I found those to be an incredibly rich resource of information about local displays. Um, this graph shows the number of contributors of Caribbean antiquities as listed in the catalog for the 1886 exhibition. Um, Barbados, as you can see, has the <clears throat> second highest number of exhibitors of um, uh, sort of artifacts from the Caribbean. And these names are generally found grouped in the miscellaneous category of the exhibition display. And usually it says something like Carib relics um, uh, associated with their names. Um, the exception, the one exception to this um, miscellaneous category uh, sort of tag is Graham Briggs who sent a significant collection of antiquities from across the Caribbean for the Colonial and Indian Exhibition in 1886. And they were put on the special display in the picture gallery of the West, Indi West India Court at the exhibition. There were four other named exhibitors besides Briggs exhibiting uh, artifacts from Barbados. And you can see them listed here. Um, and I've also put Charles James Branch down um, even though he wasn't exhibiting artifacts from, from Barbados, he was, he was born in Barbados. So there's a Barbados link there. Um, so Graham Briggs uh, died in 1887 with at least some of his collections still in the UK. And there are letters in the, the British Museum's archive that show that the Briggs collection was held in storage um, in London and that his nephew, uh, had sort of taken charge of the collection's uh, future, as it were. He made the, the artifacts available to interested uh, people from different museums, including staff from the British Museum. And one of the people from whom he took advice on the collection was Rawson Rawson, um, who, as you can see, is listed here uh, as another exhibitor at the exhibition. Um, the museum acquired some of the Briggs collection, but parts, parts of it were also acquired by other museums, including the National Museums in Scotland. So what happened to the collections after they were acquired by the British Museum? The guides to the British Museum from the early 20th century give us a bit of a clue. At least some of them were put on display in what was called the American Room, as you can see from the text on this slide. 
Um, and it has two quotes from two early 20th century exhibitions uh, to the British Museum. And you can see that they're um, talking about the specific cases that have West Indian artifacts in them. Um, there were also loan exhibitions in the Caribbean after the 1886 uh, colonial and Indian exhibition. Um, so one exhibition featuring Barbados artifacts um, was held at the Institute of Jamaica in 1895. And Edith Blake, who I mentioned um, earlier as a short to medium term resident in the Caribbean, uh, was also one of the key exhibitors in this display. But there are two collectors um, named in the reports on this 1880, 1895 uh, Institute of Jamaica exhibition um, who were specifically named for loaning artifacts from Barbados. Um, one was Reverend T.W. Bindley or Bindley, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. And the other was um, Reverend J. Messiah. I suspect um, that the latter of the two collectors, Reverend J. Messiah, is Joshua Bowden Messiah, who was a Barbadian clergyman um, who moved to the U.S. and was well regarded for his work in churches in several states. Um, and he was of African Caribbean descent. Um, Messiah loaned um, shell implements and other uh, kinds of uh, tools, and also what is called modern pottery. So collections from across the Caribbean are now found in many museums, many different museums in the UK, as well as in North America. Um, this slide shows you a selection, but I'm sure there are more, and I'm continuing to, to sort of gather information on where um, artifacts might be. Uh, not all of the museums are still around or still around under the same name. Um, so that again complicates the sort of collections history um, research, but um, that's that's what history is all about, <laughs> is tracing up loose ends. Um, and um, in the US, the collections acquired by the Hay Museum in the early 20th century uh, eventually became part of the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American in Indian. Uh, and if you go on their collections database, you can, you can find artifacts from across the Caribbean um, digitized in those uh, in, in that resource. So for the rest of the time I have, I want to talk about two projects that I've worked on, um, which deal with how you can integrate collections histories into um, museum interpretations and, um, and projects. Uh, one, uh, the first one that I'll talk about was uh, in late 2020 to early 2021. Um, and the other one just finished last month. Both of them were short-term projects, which were done alongside other projects I was working on at the time. Um, but I hope they show, oops, I hope they show how collections histories um, I have been discussing can be turned into um, museum displays and interpretations, and not just in the galleries um, digitally as well. So I'll start with the earliest project. Um, it's a digital exhibition, which I worked on during lockdown. Um, and uh, the link to the exhibition was on the previous slide, but if you'd like it, perhaps it can be circulated to you after the meeting. Um, I worked with an illustrator called Michelle Keeley Adamson on this uh, project. Um, she drew illustrated maps to highlight links between Barbados and Britain via collections histories. And I had a series of goals with, with the exhibition, um, which I hope to address. Um, and where possible, the most important one was to highlight the role of African Caribbean people in the recovery of artifacts. Um, and not to just to privilege the collectors who tend uh, to be English and, um, or, you know, of English descent. Um, and this is partly to provide content that would be of interest to the Barbadian diaspora community in the UK, as there's a large group of Bar Barbadian descendant people in Reading, and that's where I was doing um, the, the work. There were certain limitations to my goals for this project, chief of which I was that I didn't have any access to artifacts or archives because I was doing this project during the pandemic. 
during lockdown. And so it wasn't possible for me to um, actually visit the, the museum uh, archives or stores. So I had to rel rely on digital reports and other kinds of digital um, digitized primary source material. And, and Michelle had to work um, with, with that material as well. Uh, this was a very short-term project, so we couldn't be comprehensive. Um, basically, what it meant was that I chose five key locations in Barbados associated mostly with uh, Graham Briggs and Greville Chester or based on uh, references that they had in, the, in that were associated with them. Um, and then five in Britain. And again, they were based on what I could um, get access to and the records available were very much coming from a particular perspective. Um, the website sits on the University of Reading's web pages, and while it highlights connections to the British Museum, it doesn't really link to specific artifacts in the museum's collection, and that's because um, uh, the museum's um, collection for the Caribbean, sometimes there are no images to go along with the metadata on the museum's database, so um, it would be difficult to make a, a sort of direct link without without being able to see the artifact in question. Um, the illustrations in the exhibition, therefore, um, focus, fo focused more on places than on artifacts, like specific artifacts. Um, the second project, <clears throat> which was called Anime Animating Caribbean Collections Histories in the British Museum, ran between May and July this year. And it was very different. Um, most importantly, we had access to the artifacts and the archives um, because we were no longer in lockdown. This time I worked with two creative practitioners, uh, Michelle, the same illustrator that I'd worked with in the previous project, and um, another creative practitioner called Wendy Shearer, who is a British Guyanese storyteller who published a book of African Caribbean folk tales in 2022. Both Michelle and Wendy were tasked with creating a work in progress by the end of the project, responding to the artifacts and archives and collections histories that we would be exploring over the course of a series of meetings. Um, so we started at the British Museum's archive and then we went to the stores and then to the galleries and we had a number of other meetings at some um, related uh, institutions. Um, so the International Slavery Museum in Liverpool, which has artifacts from the Caribbean on display, um, and the Royal Geographical Society, which has archives um, of various people who traveled to the Caribbean and collected there. And um, part of their archive was associated with one of the objects that we uh, were looking at. We also considered how people of African descent have been pictured in art through time at the Image of the Black Project, um, which is at the Warburg Institute. And um, I'd recommend having a look. They do have a small collection of images that are um, related to the Caribbean. And um, it's a, a sort of massive image library of uh, images that have been collected from various institutions in um, various museums and cities across uh, Europe, if not further afield, also the US. Um, and so it's it's a good uh, place to go if you're interested in, in looking at how the Caribbean has been represented um, in art, which is something we were interested in. At the heart of the project, however, were 14 artifacts from across the Caribbean and um, the documentation relevant to them that we were able to locate in the museum and beyond. The group included, but was not limited to artifacts from Barbados linked to Greville Chester and Thomas Briggs. Um, and that was because I knew that there were archives that we could look at. So um, it was uh, important that because it was such a short-term project, we had a sort of focus that would um, be productive for our research. So um, here, um, oops, I'm sorry, I've gotten confused. Um, this is the um, Enlightenment Gallery in the British Museum. And the reason that I've included this slide is because this is the only place um, more or less in the museum where you can see 
um, artifacts in the Caribbean on display. Uh, there is one other room in the Car in the British Museum where there are Caribbean artifacts, but the, the museum has created a specific case um, that addresses the, um, the history of Hans Sloan, who was the sort of foundation collection of the museum who had associations with Jamaica in the 18th century. Um, and so the Enlightenment Gallery is the place where you can see the most um, Caribbean collections, which is not a lot. Um, it's, it's a handful of, of artifacts, but they are all more or less in one room. So um, this particular artifact um, is quite an interesting and quite an important artifact for um, looking at African Caribbean connections to the British Museum. Um, it was a it's a, a stool from Jamaica, um, sorry, from the Bahamas. And uh, on the underside of the stool, <clears throat> there's an inscription which reads, um, I'm paraphrasing, that it was found in a cave in the Bahamas by a slave called uh, James Thompson. And uh, then sold eventually by James Thompson to a Wesleyan missionary. Um, and it eventually came into the museum's collection. But uh, this artifact really kind of symbolizes the, um, the recovery of indigenous artifacts by African Caribbean people um, over the course of time, I think. So it was quite, it was quite a sort of potent um, artifact to discuss during this, um, the course of this project. Um, so here are some of the artifacts from around <laughs> the Caribbean that we saw in the stores. And we looked at archives relating to um, some, but not all of these artifacts in the British Museum archive, including the letter from um, Greville Chester that I uh, discussed earlier. Um, I've added the museum artifact numbers here and the description of the artifact from the, the website, which is in quotes on the slide. So going clockwise, clockwise we have Michelle and Wendy uh, examining a, a model of a canoe from Guyana, then a fragment of pottery um, with a figure on it from St. Vincent. That was um, one of the uh, artifacts that's associated with uh, George Hawthorne, who was on the slide earlier. Um, then we have uh, a tool from Jamaica, um, and uh, next is a trap fr from Jamaica, and then finally we have a spoon from, or in quote, a uh, question mark, a spoon from Barbados, which is one of the Chester artifacts. Um, and if you look carefully, it says um, below Ararat St. Michael's on it. So again, that reference to a local place. Um, so, um, just to highlight the Barbados artifacts, um, the spoon, which we've already talked about, um, on top, uh, on the left is, um, a blade from the Briggs collection and then a vessel, which is from Barbados, um, which is on the right. So, Wendy and Michelle have now created works in progress. Um, they're currently writing these up for the project webpage. So please do check this over the next little while for an update and I'll have the link um, to the project webpage um, in I think a subsequent slide. Um, the project closed with a final presentation on the 24th of July. Um, Michelle and Wendy both presented their works in, in progress um, and the talks are recorded and will be available online. Um, so they'll be linked into the, the link for the project. Um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about what they did. So Wendy took us through um, an imagined tour of Caribbean artifacts, both on and off display. She weaved in folk tales and stories from different places relevant to the artifacts and incorporated a call and response, um, which is really exciting um, into her stories. The trail emphasized the agency and the viewpoint of African Caribbean people in the recovery and collection of artifacts from the Caribbean. And it created a link to mythological landscapes of the Caribbean, which I thought was really um, exciting. Michelle took inspiration from the Enlightenment Gallery, which you can see um, a bit of here, uh, which is room one in the British Museum. 
And um, as I said, it's where you can see most of the very few artifacts from the Caribbean on display. Um, she created a digital cabinet of curiosities, which housed Caribbean collections. And artifacts were given new labels, which gave space for noting finders as well as um, collectors alongside information about the artifacts. She also incorporated space for archives for people to be able to see and um, interact with historic documentation digitally. Um, and she also included space for further opportunities, so potential for future projects. Um, I'll conclude, at, that's the link, I'll conclude here um, by saying that I hope these projects can draw attention to the material from the Caribbean in UK museums and provide ways in which we can think about collections history to tell these stories about these artifacts that present not only um, Indigenous histories, so I've been concentrating on Indigenous um, material, which is what people were collecting in the time period that I've been focusing on. Um, but how, also how people in the Caribbean have engaged with those artifacts through time, giving space for the rich complexity of Caribbean lands, people, and cultures. Um, and I hope we can continue this conversation. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amara. Um, it's wonderful um, to have had this presentation from you. It's really interesting to, to learn about these links between our history and these collections held in Britain. Um, I would like at this in this interval uh, to throw the, role, the, 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 the door open uh, for persons to ask their questions. Uh, if you are on Facebook, you can put your questions in the comments and uh, they will be transferred to us in the, via the Zoom link. If you are connected via Zoom, you can either raise your hand or type your questions in the Q&A. Uh, while we are waiting for someone to ask a question, Amara, um, why does this particular aspect of historical research interest you? I mean, the history of archaeology is a quite unusual field, I think. <laughs> yes, um, I suppose so. I, um, basically, I got interested in it um, when I came across an archive that belonged to two archaeologists, which was held in the university where I did my master's degree, so UCL. Um, and uh, I didn't really know anything about archaeology as such. I mean, I, you know, I knew as much as as your average person knows about how archaeology is conducted um, when I came across this archive, but um, it was an archive that related to this married couple who worked in Jordan in the 1930s, and um, I just was interested in why they were, what their motivations were, why they were there, um, what the context of archaeology in that time and that place was. And um, it just so happened that um, the wife of the couple um, was a very, very thorough diarist. And so I had a really rich resource to, <laughs> to use for, um, for, for the research. And um, so that, that archive kind of got me interested in. And then um, when I did my PhD, I did it on, on the two archaeologists that I'd originally come across and also um, other people that they knew. Um, so my PhD was on networks, social networks in the history of archaeology and, and basically how archaeologists got involved in archaeology in the first place in a particular time period, so late 19th, early 20th century. Um, and also what the what the sort of larger frameworks were for archaeology. So the the political frameworks of the two archaeologists that I had um, come across in my master's degree worked in Jordan, which was um, a mandate, uh, a British mandate country. And so I was quite interested in the sort of colonial context that they were working within. Um, and yeah, it just kind of went <laughs> went from there. So I've kind of taken a similar approach. Um, to this history, which is that I work from people and I kind of, I start with the people and then see see what they're doing, basically. Okay, uh, we have a question from Professor Matt Riley. 
He says, this is really wonderful, Amara. Thank you for the presentation. Do you think it is possible to, con to combat, sorry, these archival silences and get a sense of how enslaved and free Afro-Caribbean people thought about these archeological artifacts? That's a really good question. Um, it is quite difficult to combat the silences and um, all of the references that I've come across to how people are engaged with this material, how African Caribbean people are engaged with this material are not written by them. So um, one of the, I suppose one of the most interesting um, ways in which I think we can talk about this material is by talking about um, how the material is um, used in domestic settings. So there's a number of references that I've come across of um, collectors who who have collected directly from people. Um, so, for example, uh, there was a soldier, a British West India Regiment soldier, who was based in Jamaica in the sort of mid nineteenth century, and he wrote an article for one of the British archaeological journals about um, his time in Jamaica, in which he collected stone tools from various people. And he talks about how um, he went to someone's house and they had a stone tool in their water jar and that they put it in the water jar to keep the water cool. And so it seems to me that the, the ways in which we can use this archeological material to tell stories of African Caribbean history is by locating them within that domestic space. Because um, often, I mean, with all of these collections, um, the ones that I've been talking about, they're private collections that then end up in bigger organizations. And so I think the richness of the archive is really in how, or the richness of the, the sort of engagement is in how you can find it in someone's house. And that really gives you a sense of how these artifacts were, in, were integrated into everyday life. And the, the stool that I showed that's on display in the British Museum that was found by James Thompson in the Bahamas, um, on, the, on the carving on the underside, it says that he found it in 1820 and he sold it in 1835. And to me, that tells me that he kept it for 15 years. And I don't know what he did with it. Maybe he just had it as a nice thing in his house. Um, and maybe his house, you know, he was enslaved. His house probably wasn't very nice. And this thing was in his house, maybe. So it kind of gives you that a sort of window for understanding how found artifacts can maybe be transformative for someone. And it might be transformative in the fact that if someone sells it to someone else, they get money from that sale and that might be transformative to them in a, in a different way. So I think that, that's how I, that's how I would think about how, how we can kind of um, address the silences is in thinking about how people use things or might've used things from the evidence that we have, which you know comes from a particular source. Uh, do you find that um, changing ethical considerations around uh, the activity of archaeology has in any way influenced on what type of information or how much information is available um, from any time period? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I think that I think the the thing that I've found with archival material, um, which is, you know, sometimes where you get really interesting um, uh, sort of personal engagements with, with archaeology um, is that it's, you have to, you have to, you have to spend quite a long time finding it. And, and so, um, and often this stuff isn't very visible. So I think, um, I think maybe for archives it had the ethical considerations um, because it's not it's not very visible. The ethical considerations are um, still to be thought about potentially. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. 
Um, it does not look like if we have any more questions right now. Does um, Alessandra have a question? I, there's a hand up. She has a hand. Is there? Wait, wait, wait. Uh, you're seeing a hand? Because I'm not seeing I a see hand. It. I see it. Alejandra has. Oh, no, she's. Oh, wait. It's back. Or maybe it's my hand. Never mind. It's, it's, Don't it's, worry. I, <laughs> it was my I hand. have <laughs> questions, though. Okay. If you, oh, if that's you... fine, of course. Yeah. Um, Mara, thank you really very much for this very intriguing uh, discussion around this project. Um, and I think it says several things. It does remind us of a number of things that um, it typically in terms of um, documentation of West Indian collections, we tend to focus on what is in our individual countries and that seems to be the extent of it when, when in fact, for me, one of the ethical considerations is in fact looking at these connections of these items, these objects, these artifacts that have been moved out of the Caribbean and are now aligning the shelves in different storage, storage rooms in, in UK and US and other mm. collections. So I think that this kind of project is very important in terms of unmasking those colonial uh, considerations. I feel like the whole decolonizing uh, 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 strategies um, to remind us that they, they do come from somewhere and there are important connections um, to the Caribbean. Um, one of the things that occurred to me was uh, wondering, you know, wondering to what extent the, the, the reliance on the, the written material that is available, whether on labels or in articles or in journals or what or diaries or what have, is very, very important. But one of the things that occurred to me was to wonder where we, where we see people of African Caribbean descent being involved in the identification or the recovery of some of these materials, whether we might not want to consider beyond literally, we found this, or you should look here. There, there might in fact be connections around a certain type of marinage, a certain type of inheritance that is articulated elsewhere. Um, mm. I would say particularly in Haiti and Cuba where they, the, um, the, the enslaved and free uh, population did see that the Amerindian artifacts that they encountered um, were relevant to them. They were connected mm. to them. They, they pointed a way of, of um, a certain type of inheritance, if you like, or connection that enabled those people to escape their surroundings and be in a space where um, where they felt a kind of spiritual connection that allowed them to go home in a way that you, they couldn't um, with other things beyond that. So for me, when you suggest that 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 stool that you were finding, there's, you know, for for the the British person, it was a fine wooden artifact, a curiosity that mm -hmm. deserved to be collected. For the African Caribbean person, the the, Bah the Bahamian person, there probably was an understanding that this was a long heritage that needed to be um, needed to be recognized. So I just wondered whether it might not be useful to look beyond, obviously, if you can look beyond the written note and, and consider 
what these artifacts meant to the persons even unnamed. Yeah. You know, I think that would be an important consideration. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. And um, you do see kind of vague references to that in the in <laughs> excuse me in the art in some of the archaeological reports because there are references to um obia practice in some of the ways in which this material is discussed so exactly. yeah. um, so for example uh there was an american uh archaeologist called theodore du bois who wrote a whole article on superstitions related to stone stone salt um, and he talks in this article about um, going to a jail in Jamaica where someone had been arrested for obia practice and finding among his stuff, the, the prisoner's stuff, I guess he got access to it from the prison guard or whatever, and finding a stone salt within his, his belongings. And so... And there, there are other um, references like that. And often they're couched in this, in the kind of um, phrase that is indicative of people not wanting to tell um, outsider inquirers about what they use these objects for. Mm -hmm. So what you see is, um, I know that the, like from a sort of, the sort of um american or or european collector's perspective um i want to know about this artifact and i know that there's something that they're not telling me about it but i but because i'm me i can't get access to this information because they recognize me as an outsider and so there's a sort of reference to a hidden um understanding of these artifacts that is kept away from the collectors who are writing about these things. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I think that there's that there could be a really rich um, project to be done about, about how these artifacts are, are thought about in, in terms of superstition and folklore and you know, those kinds of intangible um, you know, practices. Well, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I would I would just want to 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 um, extend the point that a number of these artifacts were found in caves. Mm -hmm. And these were prime areas where people of African descent were before, particularly when they were not allowed access to uh, Christianity or other uh, spiritual practices, were able to gain some comfort and some identity mm -hmm. by finding these hidden locations, finding in them stone tools, uh, um, pottery celts, and indeed uh, wooden artifacts of certain sorts. And these had meaning beyond what uh, other onlookers might have imagined. So I think that would be a, quite an important um, extension yeah. you know, of inquiry. Yeah. Absolutely. I would I I I would love to to <laughs> to do to do that. I mean, I, you know, I'm not an expert in these things, but I think I think, you know, it's a conversation that definitely needs to happen. And mm -hmm. um and I think there are um there's there has been there have been projects on um for example, Obia um mm -hmm. Prisoner, there's a there's a big project on on people who are arrested for obia practice, and mm -hmm. um, which is run by Diana Patton at, at, in Edinburgh, um, mm -hmm. and so I think there are interesting um, maybe links that could be made to stuff that she that that has been worked on for that project. But also, um, it would be great to know if there are any if there's any folklore associated with sites or mm -hmm. with um particular artifacts or anything like that i think that would be amazing it would just be such a rich way to kind of understand these objects in a totally different you know a totally different way so yeah let's yeah. do it <laughs> uh, that's it for me but thank you so much for speculating with me that yes absolutely okay
there aren't any more questions right now, and we are coming up on uh, 4 p.m. So I'd like to thank you so much for your time and your expertise, Dr. Thornton. It's been lovely having you, and it's been a most interesting exploration um, of the way how archaeologists document and, and collect and how that influences how we understand our mutual history. So uh, thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you everyone uh, for joining in and tuning in and joining us for our history group talk. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs>